I'm going to build a power resistor bank. Uh, I want to be able to test transformers uh, from 24 volts and below up to about a couple amps. So I'm going to take a half a dozen of these and mount them to a piece of wood um, and make up some interconnects in between them. That will allow me to do parallel and series circuits between these resistors, allowing me to couple, come up with combinations from 2 to about 60 ohms. And I'm going to solder these connectors on there that will allow me to have uh, double terminal posts on each side. And I'm going to mount these right next to each other and solder these onto each one. That way it'll allow me to go parallel or series depending upon the resistance load that I need. I'm going to take uh, these little terminal blocks and mount them on either end of the resistor bank. And this will give me a little bit of flexibility on um, one, breaking the circuit if I need to, and two, to run parallel or series by having enough uh, terminal posts to mount to. So I'll start off by soldering these double posts to these resistors. They don't necessarily need to be soldered. They fit on there by pressure pretty good, but I'm gonna solder them because this is gonna be used on my bench and out in the field, so I need to make sure that it's gonna last. That's what it looks like with all the terminal connectors soldered on there. I'm going to mount these resistors to this wood. So this is how I'm going to mount them. I'm going to use these terminal blocks on either end to take the incoming power through the resistor bank and then outgoing to my multimeters. I'm not sure if I have enough, but I'm going to use these plastic rings to secure the resistors to the piece of wood. And it looks like I'm um, too short. I'll get a couple more of those, but for now I'll plan on the spacing for adding this uh, last one. I'll go ahead and mount these to the uh, piece of wood now. I'm just using these number 10 three quarter inch screws. And that's how it'll look. So I'll go ahead and finish screwing all these other ones in. I do like to party. As I was screwing these down, I was getting my spacing a little too far. So I remounted one and got it a little bit closer and adjusted for it. So I like my spacing there. Now I'm just going to mount these. And I, th I think I'm going to use these bolts and nuts to, to mount these terminal blocks as opposed to just screwing them in. Oh, that's great. As you can see, that bolt was too short, so I got uh, four more. I'm hoping to screw these in far enough to where they'll countersink themselves. Let's see if the uh, plastic holds up over here. All right, that's not bad. We'll do the second one now. Minus this last resistor, that's how the finished product's going to look. I'll end up cutting off this excess piece of the board, but I will make some notes on resistor values 
and uh, combinations of different resistors and do some basic Ohm's law equations, most likely over here on this side or probably just on the back. But for the most part, that's what the finish look of the resistor bank is going to be. So what I'll do now is I'll go ahead and make all the interconnects for the most connections needed in between these, which would be running these all in parallel. So I would need jumper from here to here to here to here to here to here, as opposed to uh, if I were to run all of these in series to get a 60 ohm load, I would just need interconnects from um, the terminal block here to this side, to this side, to this side, to this side, this side, and this side, and then down from this last one down to this terminal block and that would give me a, a 60 ohm load. But I need to go ahead and make those interconnects just in case I need them and then I'll make some long connectors for the terminal block to this last uh, connection and this terminal block to this last connection. And I'll make those interconnects with this uh, spare XLPE wire that I had. So I'll go ahead and make those interconnections now. got all the interconnects made I'm gonna go ahead and plug them in I don't know if you can see it from there but uh, let's see if I focus in here these These connectors are too big. I put the ones with the insulation on just for the fun of it. I guess that's the only one that I have. But as you can see, I can't get two on there at once. So I'll have to redo some of these connectors, if not all of them. Looks like I'll have to redo all of them because they don't fit with this plastic piece on there. Five hours later and a trip to the electronics parts store to get some of these um, female quick disconnect connectors. Fairly reasonable price. Some of this stuff is for this project and some of this stuff is just back up. I got these banana connectors for the AC motor switch that uh, I built. Here's a link to it right here. Let's see what else I got. I got these two pin perf board terminal blocks for a couple of projects that I've got coming up. I got some more of these clamps. I was out of them for the last resistor that I was going to put on this uh, resistor bank and I bought some for backup. I got these alligator clips that allow you to crimp and solder wire directly to them. I've got a couple different projects for these. I may even use a couple for this project as uh, connectors for the terminal blocks to allow you to uh, connect to your power supply. Found some of these banana connectors as well too. They have a very low profile and they're insulated all the way through and then they have the ability to uh, solder your wire directly to it. I forgot what these two wire quick connect adapters were called. I'll put a link to it right here. Uh, but I use these for various projects. What I'll do is I'll cut them in half and for Let's say, for as an example, a solar panel. I'll solder one end to the solar panel, solder one end to some terminal rings, and hook that to the battery. 
and connect this directly to the solar panel. And if I need to disconnect it to relocate it or, or change the panel, I can use these types of connectors. This is a heavier gauge too. I think this might be 14 gauge. These are only a couple bucks a piece. And I like using these for exterior locations or for locations that have a lot of vibration where these quick disconnect connectors will easily come apart. I like these, they're a little bit more durable and it seems like the connection is a, a lot more sturdier. I got some perf board. I just needed some extra part of it is for this project. And uh, I got one other project coming up that's got it. I was gonna mount this uh, directly up under one of the shelves that I have here and connect it directly to my 13.8 uh, volt DC power supply. If I've got anything that I need to test that's got a cigarette lighter, it'll be a lot easier to do that since neither of my power supplies have these directly on it. So it's only six bucks, comes with a couple screws, and it's got this plate that will allow me to mount it directly to a, a shelf. Be a little bit more convenient than the uh, setup that I got now. It gets connected to my power supply, and if I need to test something, I can use it. But as you can see, it's kind of ghetto. I had to put heat drink on it, and then I had to uh, wrap the uh, tail end of it with uh, electrical tape uh, to prevent it from shorting out on the power supply itself or anything that's up there. I've been looking for these two pin terminal blocks uh, to fit on perp board and I found the two pin ones so I can just mount here and and then solder off of this but they only had uh, one connector for it so for now I've got a couple of things that I, I need to get done pretty quick I bought some of the three terminal ones. These are a little bit heavier heavier duty, but uh, they'll work just fine. One thing I don't like about these is it's hard to get them to disconnect, but you can see how it mounts like that. And I don't like it like that. So, but I need to I need to get something done pretty quick, so I have to I have to use what I've got or what they have. I found this regulated 9 volt power supply. Here's the part number. It didn't come with a 110 volt power cable. It's pretty nice. It's regulated. I believe that's the same plug that's on my microphone. And that's what I bought it for uh, is the uh, Rode microphone project that I, I did. I think that was the last video. A uh, link to it's right here. I bought another set of banana to alligator leads. I don't know if this brand, Alenco, I don't think they're the, uh, the super highest quality. But I have a couple of other sets of these particular ones. And the banana to alligator ones, they seem like they're actually a little bit nicer than some of the other ones that they have. It's got the uh, nice leads on it. I forgot what these are, silicone. They're not plasticky at all, but uh, I use them for here in the shop. And I like being able to connect one into the other and just leave them on my power supply, for instance. And then if I need to power two different things at the same voltage, I could just plug one into the back. So since these connectors were too big, I'm going to have to make another dozen or so wires with these types of connectors on there so they'll fit on the resistor. I guess I better dry fit it first to make sure that it works. So that's going to work. I just need to make these wires. So I'll fast forward through that so you don't have to watch that again. I'm going to go through and double check and make sure each one of these connections is good. I'm going to mount the resistor that was left over that I didn't have the clamps for. I can kind of already see a weak point in this design. I'll show it to you here in a second. So the weak point that I see right now is taking these connectors on and off here uh, for any length of time this thing is uh, not gonna last. I deba debated originally before I started to put this together was to actually add a switch. I think a three pole switch right here would, would do what I need. That would give me the ability to connect from here to here, no connection at all, or connect from here to here. So that would allow me to go parallel, no connection, and then serial if I, uh, serial, and then in series if I needed. But I'll put this thing together. It's going to serve my purposes okay, and I may actually split this up to where 
this side is the same all the time and this side is the same. So like a, for instance, a 30 ohm load over here and a, I guess it would be 333 milliohm over here. Anyways, I, doing the math in my head has, has got me in trouble before. So I'll go ahead and uh, put all these on here and see what it looks like. So these three resistors right here are in parallel. So we should get a 333 milliohm reading. Let me see what we get. Got my decimal point wrong. So 3.3 .3 ohms, and then we should see 30 ohms on this side. All right, so let's make a couple more connectors and then we'll do some uh, real world load test on some 12 volt and 24 volt transformers. I've got two power supplies here. I've got a 24 volt 40 VA AC transformer, and then I've got a Altronix SMP3 power supply. This is the same combination of transformer and power supply that I carry on my truck. And the reason being is because it gives you those four capabilities, uh, 24 volt AC, 12 volt, 24 volt, 6 volt DC, all out of the, just these two power supplies. So this is Altronix SMP3. They're relatively inexpensive, has a, this battery charger built in as well too, and it fits on a DIN rail. And uh, this is just uh, an average 24 volt AC power supply. It says universal as the brand name and apparently I paid nine bucks for it. So I'm gonna make some leads that run the 24 volt AC over to this power supply and then I'll pull a couple different voltages off of that and then we'll check some loads. When you go to use this setup for the first time, double check your voltage just so you know what's coming out of the SMP3. Like I said before, it has the ability to do 6, 12, and 24 volts, but the regulator is also adjustable via this trim pot. So I'm just going to double check my incoming voltage, 26 volts, that's what we want to see. Outgoing voltage at 13.9. So to give you an example, what you can see in voltage here, and of course this was is without a load, so you wouldn't be adjusting it really without a load on there, is from 12.6 up to 15.4. So let's put a, a load on this and see what we come up with. I'm just going to leave that at 12.8 for right now. Here's what I have set up. 120 volt input being transformed to 24 volt AC. That 24 volt AC is being rectified to 12 volts DC. That 12 volt DC is going to come out to this connector. I'll connect it to this meter, which is going to be measuring the current. So it's going to go, it's going to flow through there into this black lead. And depending upon where this black lead is set up, it's going to determine how much resistance is there. And that'll determine the current draw and the uh, voltage drop, if any. So let's go ahead and get a voltage reading. If we take a look at our voltage right there, which is 1377, we should see the exact same thing right there because there's no load and no voltage drop. So let's start out with a 30 ohm load. Since we have 13.77, if we divide that times 30, we get a 459 milliamp current draw. So let's see what we get. So we're going to go out of the power supply from 10 ohms to 10 ohms to 10 ohms. And when they're in series, you add them together. So according to our math, we were supposed to see a 459 milliamp current draw. So that's basically what we see, a 450 milliamp current draw. So basically half an amp. So now what would be interesting to see is what about on a 20 ohm load? So let's do the math real quick. So we've got 1377 divided by 20 and shows we should be at a 689 milliamp current draw. 667 is exactly what we expect to see. 
and now let's do uh, 13.77. divided by 10, which is going to be 1.377 amps. So 1.38 amps is what we should expect to see. Now keep in mind these resistors are rated at a certain wattage. These happen to be 50 watt resistors. So now what we're going to do is take the voltage and multiply that times the current draw. And that should give us our wattage, which is 19 watts, and we have 50 watt resistors. So we know that we're uh, going to be dissipating heat just fine and we're not going to overpower the resistor. And again, what we should see on our current draw is 1.38 amps. There's also a significant voltage drop, so it's showing exactly what we expect. Wait for these airplanes to go by. I said I was going to test a couple more loads on different voltages, but I think you get the point. This morning I went ahead and started documenting what the resistance values needed to be for this voltage and this current draw. The reason why I picked these current draws is because this is what you typically see values for transformers in. Half an amp, an amp, and two amps. So what I'm going to do is write down the resistance values for 24 volt at these current draws as well too. And just go through that real quick. So all I'm doing is using Ohm's law to figure out what the resistance value is for these particular current draws. So what I'll do is I'll run through the process at 24 volts. So we'll start out with 24 volts and we're going to divide that by the current draw, which is 250 milliamps and that is 96 ohms. And you can already pretty much see how this is going to work out. I'll just do a couple more just in case no one's done this before. They can see the process. So we've got 24 volts and we're going to divide that by half, a, half an amp current draw. And that's 48. 2. And that's 12. You may find it beneficial to use real world numbers. For instance, 12.8 or 13.8 or 25 or 26 volts and then use those numbers to figure out what the resistance value needs to be for these current draws. Again, I'm just using this as a reference. I'm not using this as an exact science and all I'm doing is seeing how the transformer reacts under a particular load and whether it's 12 ohms or 15 ohms or 12 volts or 13 volts. I'm just using that as a reference. I'm going to be checking the current draw and seeing if the power supply gets hot or fails over time. As I mentioned before, I most likely paid $9 for this transformer. So real world, if you have a transformer that goes out that's going to cost your customer 20 bucks, are you going to go through all this process? And the answer is no. What you're going to do is just replace the transformer and move on to the next service call. Well, what about when you have a $200 or $300 power supply that has multiple outputs and you can't figure out what's drawing too much current causing the internal protection to trip? Well, that's where this comes in handy. If it's fused, you could take smaller fuses than what each output is rated for and replace them and see if it blows that fuse. Or you could put this dummy load on each individual output and see if you can recreate the failure. So this is not going to be used just to diagnose whether a transformer is bad or not or whether it's failing. Nine times out of ten, it's failed. You can't recreate the problem because it is bad and you just replace the transformer and move on. This is for a multiple output type power supply that you need to draw possibly equal current to what it's rated or more than enough current to what it's rated to see if you can recreate a failure. Another good solution, and this is what I used to do, is just buy resistors that are easily divisible by the voltage that you're using. So as an example, this is a 12 ohm resistor. And in order to get one amp current draw, I would just use one of these. If I wanted to get a half amp current draw, which is what I have here, I would just wire two of these in series, put this in the middle, and then test the load. This is another one that I used to use. If I had it to do over again, I'd probably use a bank of this style of resistor. Take some perf board, and mount these on there and do what I talked about earlier and put some switches and you probably don't need a big switch like this you could probably actually use one of these little mini switches and then just use a uh, single pole double throw type switch and that will allow you to break this side of the circuit and go parallel or series.
as an example, what we'll do is we'll go ahead and take, we'll just take this particular node of this network and we'll take that and let's see, we'll go here to here and here to here. So in down position, I'll be going through this bank of parallel resistors and that will probably give me three ohms and then I'll be able to take another lead plug it into this side and go from three ohm load to 20 ohms or to 30 ohms so let's just see if that uh, my math is correct and we've already established that uh, my math is not so good sometimes actually let's just say all the time so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take uh, our multimeter we'll put it in auto range ohms mode we'll double check the continuity so we've got uh, 0.2 ohms uh, just the resistance in the cable and if we wanted to we could relative that out and just see what the resistance is in this circuit and apparently I've got something wrong oh I see let's just switch these around here in a second okay so now I should go from Oh, the other thing is, too, is I've made a direct short across all of these. So that's not actually reading this bank. It's reading uh, just the resistance in these wires. It, uh, it's not reading the, a parallel resistance. So what I'd have to do is take it from there and put it in this network over here. And then now we see our three ohms. So i got three ohms here. And I've got, uh, let's see, I've put it like this, make it a little bit easier to see. So I'm running out of my parallel bank into my common, and then I'm taking one leg and running it through this resistor and the other leg and bypassing this resistor. So what we should see, I guess you couldn't see that. Well, that makes the whole process kind of crappy. Oh, did you see that? And I think this is part of the uh, flaw in this design part of the ceramic part broke off or whatever this coating is I don't know if this coating ceramic or not and exposed this part of the conductor now overall we're talking about 10 ohms and this getting contaminated right right here will probably not be that big of a deal considering the amount of surface area that 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 this has and the conductor is probably not going to add to a resistor that much but I think that's a, a flaw in the design and my design that is and I think ending up building something like this where these resistors are on this perf board and not having and not moving around and putting switches in between so you're not unplugging and plugging uh, with the potential to break these leads I think that's probably the best way to do it but uh, I've already built it and that's what we get that's just an interesting defect of the design that I have here back to the problem that I had before which was I had this conductor over here to this and I had this one on the common so I was getting resistance here and an open here, and I just had it miswired. We should see this part of the circuit reflected in our resistance reading, but we won't because what I've done is effectively caused a short back to this, bypassing this network. So what we should see is just a 10 ohm variance, which is this resistor being added and taken away to these two resistors in series, which is 20 ohms. So we should see a, a 10 ohm drop and then that 10 ohms put back in there. So what I need to do in order to add this bank of, let's see, I've got each one of these in um, parallel, so we should see three ohms. In order to do that, I have to actually put it on this side and not cause a short on this side. So now we should see 33 and then we should see 23. Okay, and that's what we see. And if I redesign this and put it on perf board, I'll end up putting uh, switches in between each one of these banks of resistors to either put that node in series or in parallel. So by the numbers over here, the only resistance value that we can't really get close to is 96. I only have six 10 ohm resistors and when you wire them in series you get 60 ohms. So if you decide to design a resistance substitute box or in this case a resistance substitute board, a couple things that you might want to keep in mind. This design wouldn't be all that bad, but unfortunately I put so much stress on this connection right here, or on this joint rather. Um, what I would recommend is 
building these types of jumpers with just alligator clips on it so it just makes it easier to grab it. I probably would have mounted these closer together and possibly putting these two terminal blocks on the same side. But overall I'm happy with how it worked out. I'll probably end up either dedicating a set of alligator clips to these or just make some on my own. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Accesscontrolforum.com slash wiki, W-I-K-I, is a wiki that's for people in our industry. We are still working on the format, so if you have any suggestions, feel free to email me. We've also updated accesscontrolforum.com slash calendar, and that's got national and international events on there. We may update with regional events, but as of right now, we're just doing the bigger conferences.